Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, Ali Duzet here. Today, I have an anonymous guest to come and talk to us about inflation and the price increases that we're seeing at the grocery store and at the gas station and also everywhere. Um, so uh, this was kind of born because I've been planning to do an inflation session to work on the energy of inflation, not for the nation, but for us. How are we going to respond to these increased prices and to what's going on financially in the nation as a whole and kind of in the world as a whole? And uh, so I called up my friend to to get her take on it because I know that she knows quite a lot about inflation and um, economics and everything. And as we had this conversation, I thought, oh my gosh, everyone needs to have this conversation, like, let alone the session. I want everybody to be aware of what we're talking about right here. So I asked if she would come on tonight. For the record, we had this conversation mere hours ago, and she agreed to come talk to us. Um, and she made this beautiful PowerPoint presentation for us. And so uh, we're going to go through it together. And uh, we're going to have a good time. And then later I'll do the inflation session, not tonight, but all of us will have a better idea of what's going on so that we will be able to handle it better. Knowledge is power. And so here we are. And um, let's see, I'll stop my own video and share my screen of this uh, <clears throat> of this. And let's see my, my anonymous person here. Okay, good. You're unmuted. Do you want to say hi? Hello, everyone. We can consider this the uh, the State of the Union pre-watch show, pre-game show, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I'm not as experty as Allie may have have indicated, but I know a lot. I, I will say with some pride, I've studied I've studied this a lot, and I have some really strong feelings about it. So I think what she really wants is for me to share my really strong feelings and the experiences that, if you're Allie's age or younger, you you missed out on. If you're my age and you were born in the 50s or 60s, you, you might still remember your parents having a lot of problems. So if Allie's ready for me to just get rolling on a quick PowerPoint uh, about some terminology and, and how we got to this place, and then we can talk about some more random thoughts. Are we good to go, Allie? Yeah, I think so. And I don't know, guys. She says she's not an expert, but you guys judge for yourselves, okay? <laughs> okay. Ready, set, go. <laughs> All right. So the title of this little quick PowerPoint, which took about 40 minutes, so it could have been refined over several hours, but we'll just go with it as it is. Um, are, it's, are we winning yet? And I, I want you to look at that button. That button is a real button that people used to give out to put on your lapel and wear it to show that you are winning. Next, Ellie. The last time the U.S. experienced high inflation, it was the 70s. And though that, that's a time when we had names like Nixon and Elvis, and we wore bell bottoms, and, and we had Watergate and the Iraq War and sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And of all of those, the one thing I remember the most, of course, was the bell bottoms. But I, I do know that the rest of the things were happening. I was a small child when this all came down. Uh, next, Allie. Oh, here's some imagery from the 70s, just so you can really like get in the mode of what we were dealing with. We had all this crazy stuff and inflation. Next. Back then, with inflation in the range of 15% per year, we were given little buttons that said WIN, which stood for Whip Inflation Now. They were supposed to cheer us up. They, they didn't. I can remember getting them in school, like my teachers were handing them out and you, as they let us out early so we could go with our moms and dads to the gas station on our assigned gas day to fill up our tanks halfway because that was all the gas we had and all we could afford and um, it was to make us all feel better. Next. So let's talk about what is inflation. And I am not an economist. I studied economics, but I did not get my degree in it. And I just want to make that clear. Uh, but I, I, I want you to understand I am a communicator and I've worked in media and I work in communication. I can tell you that today's media confuses terms a bit and that can maybe lead you to be confused. So let's just talk about what is inflation. Inflation is not price increases. Inflation causes price increases. Inflation is an economic term for an increase in the amount of money in the economy. And it's really complicated. So I am also summarizing but trying to help you understand the difference between the two terms. So inflation is, a, is a, a word for how the money supply changes over time. 
high prices result from inflation. It's, it's weird. Go on to the next one, Allie. So what is inflation? The increase in the US money supply causes prices to increase because the more dollars in the system, the less each dollar is worth. So then it takes more dollars to buy something. So inflation causes price increases. And you could say, well, how did more money get into the money supply? Well, over the last three years, for example, the Congress keeps voting all of these rescue packages and, and TARP and DARP and Better Back building and all this stuff. And that if, it, they, if they don't have the money to do it, remember all those times when they said this is deficit spending? If it's deficit spending, the only way to spend money you don't have is to borrow it, which they don't have to borrow it, they just make it. So they make it, put in the money supply. So that's how the money supply increases. But unless there's a whole bunch more stuff to buy with that money, it just means that the things themselves get more expensive because each dollar is worth a little bit less. So you can move it next, Ali. So what else is inflation? Inflation can also, the, the, the increase in prices can also be caused um, because of other things like constricted supplies. So maybe it's harder to get plastic stuff or computer chips or used cars. Or maybe our supply chains are a little broken, or maybe there's labor shortages, things like that. So that can also cause um, higher prices. Today, for this chat, we'll just use the word inflation to describe the increase in prices, but I, I would kind of in your mind, I'd like you to put little quote marks around it because you have to understand what the media is, is saying. When they say inflation, they mean higher prices, but, but it's a deeper and more complicated situation than that. You go, Allie. Wait, before we move on, I just want to, I just want to clarify. So we're talking about, in, so again, inflation is different from the price increases, but the inflation, we're talking about the money supply inflating, like you could inflate a balloon, right? So we're, right. we're, we're adding more and more dollars into the overall economy. So what we're talking about there is like, would, is this true? Like I've been getting these checks from the United States treasury for like my child, um, you know, like the, my child tax, whatever, like they're sending me the payments now. And so like all of that money that I wouldn't have had before, now I have it now. So now I can be like, oh, I'll go and spend it on, you know, gymnastics class and whatever. But, it, but, and that works in the moment because I just got this money and prices haven't gone up yet. But then because everybody got so much more money, everything is more right now more people can say let's buy some gymnastics classes and the gymnastics teachers like oh wow well all that people are interested in my gymnastic class i should charge more and I, i'm not trying to say she's greedy but she she also has to ration her services she can't can't teach every kid in utah county how to do gymnastics she has to decide how, how is she going to show her value she's going to have to raise her prices and limit her supply a little bit because she can't have an infinite amount of gymnastics classes so if you think about the same thing happened when the conquistadors found gold in America, they were from Spain, they came, they found a bunch of gold, they took the gold home, they went, the first thing they did probably when they got off the boat was go to a restaurant, and they all bought food and then the people who are cooking the food said wow, there's all these people with money they want food, I guess we should raise the price of food so that they could get you know so it kind of feeds through this whole there's a lot of psychology to it but there's also unless the amount of food increased the only way to, to be able to address the increased demand is to increase the price because there is no more of stuff, right? Inflation in the end describes a situation where more money is chasing less stuff. And so the only way to uh, appropriately value the stuff is to raise its price until it rebalances. So it's all a balancing act. And we can talk about this a little bit more. I'm just trying to do a quick little a bit of history and terminology so that when you're listening to the news or looking at social media, you can have a better idea of what, what they're saying to you and understand that they're not necessarily telling you the whole picture because the whole picture is complicated and it's hard to understand. We all get that. So in the 1970s, back, you know, back in the day when we were winning, um, inflation is placed on outside effects such as oil price increases. And I put in all these little teeny words. If we go back later, you can read them. But what it really talks about is during the early Nixon years, they decoupled the, the value of the dollar from anything kind of real and the value of the dollar went down. Um, and so 
that is devaluing the dollar. If you devalue the money, then the, the cost of things goes up because the money is worth less. It's not worthless. It is worth less than it was. So the difference is going to be that you're going to have a higher price. So you can go next, Allie. So in the 70s, inflation was placed on outside, blamed on outside effects, usually associated with oil price changes. And, and honestly, oil and energy, they underlie so many parts of our economy and so many parts of the things that we do that that makes total sense. You can look at this little graphic, the price per barrel of oil quadrupled during the 1973 oil embargo and then doubled again in 79 as a result of the Iranian revolution, which also affected oil supplies. And that's, it's really easy for the media and the government and everybody to blame outside factors for something that people notice like rising prices. But if you look back in history, government action devalued the dollar first. But going into these oil shocks, each dollar already had a lower value because government could just create more money, and they did. So they, they are trying to say, it kind of turned into, in my view, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I don't work for the government, but I, just to say, it was a kind of a squirrel situation. Look over there, oil is costing more. It can't be what we're doing. And, and, and that's sort of how this happened. They, they first decoupled the dollar from any kind of store of actual value, then the value, the dollar became devalued and then prices went up and then they blamed a lot of other things. You can go on, Allie. There are a lot of reasons for the government to talk about inflation and manipulate your impressions of inflation. The government's accepted inflation rates can affect social security payments, Medicare and Medicaid rates, government contracts, and even some tax rates. So every time the, the uh, government, they, they send it out, if you'll notice the government doesn't say this is inflation. They have a measurement called the CPI, Consumer Price Index, and that is a compilation of a market basket of goods that they kind of put together and, and they compare from quarter to quarter or month to month and look at how the prices of everything change. And that's how the government reports it. But all of that um, reporting uh, directs how much people get paid in social security or how much doctors get paid when they operate on Medicare patients. Some government contracts are affected by inflation rates or the, the reported CPI. So they, that, that rate, that inflation information, the price change information actually affects a lot of things that are sort of behind the scenes. So for the last few years, when inflation has been and we'll say, quote, unquote, low, uh, Social Security really hasn't risen very much. Inflation gets higher. Social Security payments to old people go up. Well, what does that do to the United States government budget? It increases their expenditures because now they have to send more money to old people. So the, each of the there, there's a lot of reasons why the government wants to have a low uh, CPI or a low reported inflation rate because that that will hold down costs to the government in other ways. So if you're gonna go on, Ali. Uh, wait, um, mm -hmm. I, I'm having a little a little memory maybe, do they not count grocery inflation in this calculation? This is, this is, is that true. true? The, the government does the CPI, which is the Consumer Price Index, and that is based on what they call a market basket of goods. And back in the day, back in like the 60s, 70s, because they've had the CPI around for a long, long time, but that market basket did include things like maybe bread, like a real market basket. They had it had some foods and this is a lot of, um, you know, they had a lot of things that you use every day. And sometime in like the 90s, they decided that the cost of food and fuel um, were too volatile and they had too much of an impact on inflation. And so they, they changed, um, they changed the market basket. They actually change it kind of a lot. Um, remember in the 70s, it didn't include things like computers, but now it does because now we have computers. Um, so it leaves out food and fuel because they're considered too valuable or too volatile. And it, it, they do kind of switch it up to, to include things that we use now that we didn't use then. And I did see somebody pop up in a little bit of a chat and that social security recipients 
you know, they pay the same higher prices as well. My point is not that they don't deserve the extra money or that they don't need the extra money. My point is that the government has an interest in keeping the amount they pay for social security as low as possible. So they want to manipulate the reporting of inflation and price changes so that they don't have to pay as much. I, this is not about whether you deserve or use your social security payment. I, I had, I mean, I have worked with people who have social security payments and I would sit there and fume that because they leave out fuel and food, which it turns out social security recipients actually also eat and they also use cars. So because those two things are left out, but those are huge cost increases for many people, even when inflation is reported to be one or 2%, the, the cost of food and fuel can be much higher. So this is not about whether you deserve it, need it, use it. This is about the government's incentive to keep it as low as possible. Thank you for explaining that. <clears throat> That was really what I was kind of wondering, because I feel like food inflation is so much higher than what is reported uh, in that CPI. And so, but you explained that that way, by leaving food out of it, they can they can claim that they're adequately supporting our seniors and everything, while totally knowing that they're really not. <laughs> right. <laughs> they're just saying it's too volatile. That. Yeah, it's too volatile to include. So if you want to go into the next one. Okay, so there, and remember guys, this is such a summary. This is like the most summarized summary of, of inflation economics. It's, it's so short that we're just gonna, we're speeding through so we can actually talk about things. But cost increases can affect your impression of the government too, right? Lot, government is manipulating your impressions of inflation because your impression of inflation affects how you feel about your government. And that can also affect how you vote. So they want you psychologically to feel like prices are not, if you're experiencing high prices, that might just be you, right? I mean, you go to the grocery store and you see that bread costs 25% more today. You go to the gas station, it costs 20% more today than it did last week. And, and, and then they say, well, inflation is only 7%. Really? And, and that's possibly based on their market basket, which includes things like shoes. And, um, you know, it might include, it might include, computers, it might include Kindles, it might include a lot of things, you have to look up exactly what's in it, it's, they change it. So the point is that they are always trying to, they, they will say they're putting in a representational kind of mix of items that you can buy. And that is probably true. But, um, but, that, but it's not the things you think. It, it really is not the things you think. So um, hmm? I interrupt you. And so so part of this situation with inflation plus the media and like everything that's kind of going on on a national level, like, so are, uh, am I understanding this correctly that, um, that basically they can kind of manipulate things a little bit on their end in order to, uh, you know, hopefully, again, affect your impression of the government in case of an election. So we have an election coming up this year and so maybe there's going to be a little bit more action on a government and possibly a media level just to kind of control like the narrative about what's happening. I think you will see like when I went to go find that uh, little graphic of the gas station from the 70s, I, I literally looked up graphic of gas station in the 70s. And that came from an article from the Minnesota Times from last November that was saying inflation is not that bad. And, and so I, I kind of did a little quick scroll around, uh, you know, Google and discovered a lot of media articles telling us that inflation might, it might feel like you're having inflation, but no, you're not having inflation. You're just seeing some rising prices, but it's all explainable. It's nothing like we've had in the past for sure. And don't worry, don't worry about it. Don't, so, you know, it, it kind of depends on where you're getting your news because you're also gonna hear voices that say, oh my gosh, there's so much inflation. Our, I think part of our goal here tonight, or at least mine, is to say, you need to do your own research and you need to feel comfortable with, with um, these terms and understand every time you hear somebody telling you something, you need to be able to, to, um, to discern the truth of it. And, do not take your ha, ha first impression. You need to you need to really think, pray, um, do your research before you jump either into full panic or into 
uh, be lulled into false security about it. You need to be able to, to do your own thinking. And just remember that everyone out there right now has an agenda, especially we have an upcoming election. We have people who are still bitter about the last election. You have, you have all these different pressures going on. Let's, let's not be, let's not let them confuse us. We need to keep our focus where the focus should be. So let's move on quick and we'll just, we got to roll here. So how the government measures inflation and price increases has changed over time. So another point here is it's no longer possible to compare today's quote unquote inflation with quote unquote inflation from decades ago. If we use the same market basket today that they used back in the seventies, our inflation rate today would look more like 15 to 16% than seven. And that's just because of how they've changed the market basket. But you also have to remember, go back one time, go back one, one. But I want you to also remember uh, that things like a shoe in the 70s, I can remember my mom absolutely having to come apart because the shoe, the cost of shoes had risen and my feet grew. I was a kid. So my feet grew. Now I need new shoes. Oh my gosh, they're $30. Well, people, have you been to Target lately? You can get shoes now for like $15 or, you know, not great shoes, but you can. We didn't have cheap shoes back then. All the shoes were expensive. So, so there, the market basket can reflect that some some goods have lower costs now than they did and they might be better made even today's cheap shoes are probably nicer than some of the more expensive shoes that we got in the 70s when i when i bought a parka for school in the 70s i had one choice it was brown and it was kind of warm now i can get a parka in any color and i can get it with glitter and i can get it you know, with fur stuff on the collar and it can be super warm or it can be very lightweight. So we have way more choices now. So you can't totally uh, bash the government for, for changing the market basket. They're trying to respond to the fact that we have different choices now too, okay? So next one. Another impact of inflation is rising interest rates. In the seventies, interest rates on debt rose very high. From mortgages in the range of four and 5% in the sixties, Rates for mortgages rose to 15 plus percent in the 70s. My parents had a mortgage once that was 16%. On a 30 year mortgage, 16% interest, and they thought they had been, it was, it was great. Credit card rates were, you know, 25, 30, 35%. And that was just a reflection of the inflation. Um, interest, interest and inflation are linked in this, or we'll call it quote unquote inflation, price increases and interest are linked. At the same time, savings accounts were paying between seven and 10%. So we were, you could actually look on your bank statement and see an interest uh, earned on your account that didn't look like $4. Um, so this, that was a difference back then. You could actually see a number. It wasn't as big as the inflation, but you could see that it was, um, that there was actually money being earned on your accounts. Can you turn that, Allie? So compare that to last year where mortgage rates were 2.5% or so, and savings account interest rates have been less than 1%. I want you to notice, it for it to make sense for you to save and invest money, interest rates actually need to be higher than inflation, right? Otherwise, it makes no sense to save your money. You might as well go spend it because it's going to cost more tomorrow. But interest rates have not been higher even than even in the government's inflation rate, interest rates have not been higher than, than inflation in a very, very long time. So go on, Ellie. So is inflation a problem? Again, scroll through the, the Google today and you will see that some economists say it's not a problem. It's a sign of our recovery. It's a sign that things are going well. Uh, economists disagree on all sorts of stuff. Um, so do dentists. I mean, they're people. So they have different philosophies, different politics, different, um, different motivations. So just so we understand, some economists will tell you that inflation is okay. Um, but we all agree, I think we all agree, all of us here on this call tonight agree that inflation is a problem for us because we're the ones writing the checks at the grocery store. So you can go on. Price increases like inflation make a vice of virtue. And that that's actually, is I didn't make that up. That's a thing. Because instead of saving up for something, it makes more sense to buy something now because that thing will cost even more tomorrow. So this encourages us to be panicked and buy, like we put ourselves into scarcity mode 
and maybe go into debt. And uh, if interest rates start to go up though, then debt will cause even more problems. And again, if, if you're my age and I'm not in social security land yet, but I'm flirting with it. And because I was a kid in the seventies and, and I remember people getting eaten up with interest debt, mortgage debt. I remember interest rates were super high. We've all gotten used to this interest climate with mortgages and car loans where interest rates are in the single digits. We, you've got credit card debt out there that's maybe 20, 25, 30, but you choose that. But if you're looking at big purchases like cars and houses, you, you guys who are younger than 35, you don't know what it's like to be looking at 12% mortgage. And, and you can't, you, what you can afford at 3% interest, you cannot afford at 12%. And, and this, this will cause all sorts of problems with debt, private, personal, individual debt uh, in our economy because so many people have borrowed so much. So just to understand that inflation, interest rates, and debt, they, they make this weird triangle of interactions that you need to be watching out for in your own life, but watch what happens on a national scale too. Okay, next. Oh, that, yeah. So what do we do? So changing out from this kind of historical look at things, I, I, this is a, a, a sheet of ice cracking and somebody's blood pressure going up. Ali can move to the next slide. And, and these, are, these are things that I remember people expressing when I was a child. I didn't totally understand it, but now as an adult, I do. And I wanted to talk through some of the feelings that we may have. I mean, you may feel crushed. You may feel this burden of, of how can I afford it? You might feel like you're losing the race. How you got a raise. I got a raise. I got a great raise, but it was half as much as the, um, as inflation was. <laughs> so I actually lost ground. So you might feel like you're losing a race. You might feel like you're just balancing on thin ice. You might feel panic when you go to the store. Your heart might beat faster when you pick up that package of meat that you could afford two weeks ago, but now it, you just can't. You may feel uncertain. You might feel like you're getting blown around and you're trying to balance all of these pressures in your, in your budget. And you might feel like a failure and like you can't support your family. And all of those are really valid feelings. I think part of what I was hoping to accomplish with that first part is you're not, this is not the first time people have felt this way. This is not the first inflationary climate that has been experienced. Again, you go back to Spain in the 17, well, Spain in the 1500s, the Netherlands in the 1700s, Europe in the 1800s. These are all, the, all of those times and places have had incredibly uh, crazy inflationary spirals. Germany in the 1930s, nobody wants to be sitting there with you know, barrels full of money that you might as well burn because it's worthless. But, but we need to learn, from the, learn the lessons from those people and understand that, that those societies have, have worked their way through this. It's hard. It's hard to work our way out of an inflationary cycle. And we have to be prepared for the difficulty that lies ahead. But we can't, we can't lose it. Like we have to be the ones that are prepared and able to handle these challenges. So just some random thoughts in this really quick PowerPoint, if Ali will move it forward. You know, watching where we were in the 70s and then again in the 08s, if people remember that, I think Ali was like not very old in the 08s, but that's when the last time our economy flirted with crashing completely, when the stock market lost 30% of its value in a day or something, it was, it was crazy town. You, you, if you were not, invested at that time, you just watch your money that you had in your retirement uh, account, just, you know, evaporate. Um, here are some thoughts that I learned from those periods that I've lived through so far. Avoid debt whenever you can. It's one thing to invest in a house and a car. Those are investments. They help you perform your jobs. They help you get, you know, shelter your family, but um, avoid debt when you can. Credit card debt is especially dangerous because credit card interest rates can change very quickly. They can change any month, they can change in a month. So that can make your debt escalate much faster than you can ever hope to keep up with. So you're just going to want to really watch your debt and especially your, your credit card debt. And next, um, understand for yourself needs versus wants. And I say for yourself, um, 
uh, Allie will attest, we're very good friends. She knows what a hit I get out of shopping. I love shopping. I love, I love getting stuff I want. But I also understand what I need. I found this uh, little graphic about Ikea. Six out of 10 of Ikea purchases are unplanned. <laughs> that means they walked into the store not planning to buy the thing. And you can see the little guy there saying, I just came here to get a new spatula. I've been to Ikea. I am that girl. I walk out with, you know, $100 worth of stuff I didn't plan to get when I walked in. So just be aware, needs versus wants. And if that means that you adopt, everything's going to be on a list. You're going to be, however, whatever tool you have when you go shopping, when you're thinking about the things that you have to do with your money, that, that you have a really good understanding of where, of, of what you actually need. Next. Okay, work with your family to create reasonable financial goals and budgets. I think that's a really reasonable suggestion. Um, difficult times are difficult. It took 20 years until the price hikes and interest rates of the 70s were mostly reset. And that, that was a lot of economic work for our government. And finally, next. Remember always that you are being manipulated and influenced by the media and government to expect, want, and react a certain way when it comes to the things you buy and the prices you pay. Overall, our standard of living is much better than it was in the 70s. Why do I say that? Well, again, almost all of us have a car. Do you know in the 70s, not everybody had a car. Um, not everybody had good shoes. Now you can go to Target and still you can buy sandals and shoes and they're, they're still relatively affordable. Our, our groceries as a percentage of what we're spending, still actually a little bit less than they were in the 70s. If you go back and look, I'm not lying to you. We actually have, we have so much abundance in our lives. And sometimes we're just so wrapped up in, in how much things cost that, that we forget to do the next thing, which is uh, live in a state of gratitude for what you have and do not focus on what you do not have. And, and that will help you a lot with inflation. <laughs> Just always remember, I mean, I know that we all have needs, we do. And there's going to be that moment when your kid needs shoes. And I can remember my mom crying about it. I can, she didn't have the money for new shoes. And, and so we are going to have those moments when as parents, we are going to not be able to do as much as we want to with our money. Um, we are going to have to do the next thing, which is rely on the Lord to help us provide in a righteous way. The principle of tithing and charity teaches us all to do more with less and to be oriented to giving rather than acquiring. And while I was pondering this a little bit further, I had two, two other additional thoughts. One, one was in response to a, a comment that was uh, posted on when Allie had her Facebook invitation and somebody said, yes, I, we need to um, have the power to survive this. And I thought, how funny, on my way home in the car, without reading that comment first, I had been thinking about how I would hope to empower people to see what was happening with inflation and its impact on their lives. And it came to my mind that power was the wrong word. We can't be empowered here, but that we have the word, the word a different word came into my mind, and it was glide, uh, which is that we are going to need to be prepared to to be, to be above these influences and to kind of rely on the Lord because we cannot, we, we cannot do enough for ourselves. We are going to have to learn to rely on the Lord. And, and as I sat here at home, um, nervous about this chat, uh, it came again into my mind and I, I did not have a, a slide for this, um, Helaman 13, for those of you who are members of the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, that is a, a set of scriptures in the Book of Mormon, Helaman 13, and I would draw particular attention to those of you who are around to verse 18, um, which I would read right now. This is a, a sermon from a prophet named Samuel the Lamanite, and he, um, he was teaching people about the coming of Christ, about the first coming. And he says, and it shall come to pass, saith the Lord of hosts, yea, our great and true God, that whoso shall hide up treasures in the earth shall find them again no more because of the great curse of the land, save he be a righteous man and, sh and shall hide it up unto the Lord. Now go down to 
if if Allie's got this up, go down to scripture 31, which it kind of goes on to this. Behold, the time cometh that he curseth your riches, that they become slippery. You can't hold them. And in the days of your poverty, you can't retain them. And in the days of your poverty, you shall cry unto the Lord. And in vain shall you cry, for your desolation has already come upon you. And your destruction is made sure. And then shall you weep in hell. Now, he's talking to, to evil people in an evil society. But I think we can all agree our society could be described in very similar terms. And then go down to pay, uh, the, last, the last verse of that same chapter. O ye people of the land, that you would hear my words, and I pray the anger of the Lord be turned away from you, and that you would repent and be saved. And as I read this whole um, chapter, it just struck me that this sermon was for us. It was, it is absolutely for us. We are fighting. I, I read one of the comments. She says, should I pull my money out of the stock market? Should I put it in a different bank? What should I do? It will not matter. I am, my money's in a bank. My money is in the stock market. My IRA is where it is because in the end, it, it, there is, these forces are too great. The society we live in is very flawed. Uh, even the best people have a lot of problems. Um, and I don't think that right now we're governed by the best. And we have um, just so many challenges that the idea that we can micromanage this sort of thing is, it, it's just, we're going to have to rely on the Lord. And if you go back to that one scripture where it says you need to hide it up for him, you have to focus on what, the, you know, behold, the time comes, he curses your riches that they become slippery, that you can't hold them. And I think we're getting close to a time like that. We, it, does, it will not matter. These are slippery riches. It is the curse of the slippery riches. And we are, neat. We are going to have to be really focused through this time on what is most important. What is that? Spiritual health, spiritual growth, repentance, 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 obedience to the Lord, obedience to the gospel, all of those things. And now I'm done. Now I've talked a whole bunch. So now Allie can go back to everything. <laughs> Thank you so much here. I wanted to pull up my own favorite scripture from the New Testament, which is Matthew 6, 33, um, which I'm just crazy about this scripture. Um, because this is all exactly what we are dealing with right now. It's our worries about how are we going to be clothed? How are we going to eat? How are we going to drink? You know, how are we going to get through this? Um, like I went grocery shopping today for the first time in almost two weeks because I had been off visiting family and I came back and found that everything cost so much more. Like my mind was blown in 10 days. And, um, and so these are the questions, uh, but this is the answer. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things thereof. <clears throat> so, okay, um, let's, uh, do we have any, any other questions? Or my friend, would you, be, um, would you be interested in having your video on the screen? You don't have to, um, but we could continue this conversation face-to-face -face since the um oh you disabled my video i'm fine um and then but remember we have we have about 12 minutes and then we have to go listen to our beloved leader yes we get to go and listen to um to the state of the union tonight in about 15 minutes um yeah. but yeah if you have questions go on in and um and type them into the chat and we'll talk about them um what do we do for those of our family who aren't obedient that's oh, I, I can't turn on my video because only you can oh, do that. I'm sorry. Okay. But if um, you don't want to, that's okay. <laughs> I can't. No, everyone should see how great you look. If you want to be on the screen, there we go. I, it's okay. I did my <laughs> hair today. Okay. You did. <laughs> Bye, guys. Let's see. Bye. So. Okay. So what do we do? I can't see the chat, though. Uh huh? I can't see the chat. Okay, what, what can we do for those of our family who aren't obedient? So I have my own thoughts about this. Do you have a thought about this? Shall I just jump I, in? I, I will bow to you, you do it. Okay, um, so my, my thought about this is uh, that, okay, hold on. Let me see what is happening. Wow, to multi um, 
Okay. Anyway. Um, okay. It all, it has come down to boundaries because this is my opinion. I think we're in crunch time right now. I think that we really and truly are in the crunch time and that, um, this is the time of slippery riches possibly. And we can't save people that aren't willing to play the game. You know, the big thing that we need to do is get boundaries and ask for the divine perspective on this situation so that we can let go and trust that the divine is going to take care of this for us. That, um, you know, it breaks our hearts to see people that we love and care about, um, experiencing hard times, but they have to like, and that that's what the point is right now is that now is the time we're just creeping up on this time where we get some retribution. Okay. Not, or, you know, this is the time when everybody's karma is kind of going to catch up to them. And unfortunately, or fortunately, it's going to be a lot financial. Can we have that faith to trust the divine to take care of us? If we can, everything's going to be fine. If we can't, things are going to be not fine. But why? The reason why is to hopefully get people to get their act together and figure it out, right? And so they can start living in alignment with these laws of the universe. Um, and I do want to mention that also. Um, I, for me, I feel like the universe is bigger than any religion. Okay, the universe and reality is bigger than than these books and like scriptures, which I love, but these scriptures are here to teach us about how reality functions. And here we have a whole society and a whole planet of people who have been living desperately out of alignment with actual reality and the laws of the universe. We have, uh, I mean, there's many religions with lots of scripture that are trying to teach you get in alignment, get in alignment with the universe. And um and when we are, we get blessed and we, we are okay. Um, and so this is, this is really for our good. This is all a big opportunity for us to practice, um, to practice living in alignment, let there be light. Um, and uh, yes, hello. I, so I just wanted to say, to go back to your first sentence, you're doing great, but the idea of boundaries, I mean, I think that is a really key. I, I, since the time I was very young, we have to say, um, where's your circle? Where's your, what is your authority and your stewardship? And just be really clear about that because compassion can suck you dry and you have to be, and, and, and it can be false compassion. Like if you are trying to help someone, you have to be sure that they are prepared to accept your help and that your help can actually help them. And maybe in Allie's next YouTube, we can talk about some experiences we've had and seen with people who we tried to be compassionate and it didn't work out the way we thought. And it's not that, that they were a failure or we were a failure. We we're all trying to explore how to share, how to help. And, and in the end, um, I think the idea of you, you, are, you have a stewardship and you are responsible for people in your stewardship. Maybe that's your parents, maybe that's your kids, maybe it's your next door neighbor you need to understand what your stewardship is. And if you, if you don't, if you're like a little bit, um, if you're not feeling super inspired about it, pray for inspiration about what is the best way for you to help that person. It may be helping them. It might be not helping them. It's, and that is going to be a, something that you and heavenly father and the Holy ghost are going to have to work through together. Like you're going to have to work through the spirit to figure that out. Because if you don't do that with inspiration, you can actually do more harm than good. So as you were um, giving this lecture and talking about the conquistadores uh, and their inflation from finding all that gold, I thought of a different story where somebody found a lot of gold, uh, Mansa Musa. You remember oh, in, Africa? in Africa? Yeah, 1323, 1324. I looked him up because I was like, Mansa Musa did this too. He was this really religious um, Muslim king in um, in. Mali. Like Algeria, yeah, Mali. Mali. And his empire found an inconceivable amount of gold. And he piled up, okay, he had 60,000 companions, 12,000 slaves, each of whom was carrying four pounds of gold, 80 camels, each laden with 50 to 300 pounds of gold each. And um, 500 of his servants rode in front of him, each carrying a 10 and a half pound gold staff, okay? And, um, 
this little line from whatever I'm reading, he says, though Musa had more gold than he could have possibly spent on his journey, that didn't stop him from making the effort. And Mansa Musa really felt like it was his job to be generous and compassionate. And he started throwing money at everybody. He would give beggars gold ingots. He would just walk around and he gave like 20,000 ounces of gold um, at, at every holy place that he passed on the way. And in the end, um, I'll, this little sentence, the instantaneous and incalculable influx of gold into Cairo, Mecca, and Medina caused hyperinflation, the likes of which had never been seen before and never has been seen since, and nearly impoverished all three great cities for over 10 years. He gave away about 71,000 pounds of gold, and all of a sudden gold meant nothing. Gold was useless, so they had no money, so nobody could buy anything because to buy anything would require an enormous amount of gold because all the gold was so cheap. You could go outside and just pick up some gold Mansa Musa dropped on the ground for you. So how are you going to, you know, it divorced money from worth. And right. that's kind of what we're seeing right now is there's so much money in the economy that the worth of everything has gone down. The worth of the money. More. Yeah. The money has gone down. Right. So it takes more and more and more. Right. Um, but I, I bring it up because as you were talking, I thought this is kind of a dilemma that probably um, maybe our divine source has to deal with as well. Like, can God just shower us with tons and tons of blessings that maybe we don't deserve or maybe that we won't appreciate and take care of? Like, if if we didn't have to deal with the cause and effect relationship with money, and if we could just have Mansa Musa drop tons of gold into our laps just for existing, like this would cause an enormous problem. <laughs> is actually really good and important because it's it's going to stabilize things in the long term and make things in alignment in the long term but in the meantime we can all just sit here and like it's easy to say geez I wish Mansa Musa would just like toss a gold bar at me but no you really don't want that (laughs) Um, and the other thing that I thought of um really quick oh did it just leave my brain Let's see if I can remember it really fast about um, money and inflation. Oh, your concept about gliding and this idea of like wanting the power to um, to kind of control our situation through this time versus kind of like floating through it and working with it. Um, as you were talking about that, I, I've been thinking about this a lot because I feel like I'm kind of a weird person in, in the energy world in that... Um, you know, like I really believe that energy work can do a lot of things, but I don't think it can effectively detox your heavy metals. You know, I just don't. That has not been my experience. And I think that you can use your mind to uh, to do a lot of things, but I'm not sure that your mind can like single handedly undo the effects of inflation for everyone that you know and yourself and your household and everything that you have to buy. Like, I, I really feel like we do have to also work with the reality of the situation here. Um, and well- well, can I just I can just add that if you think about the difference between a glider, that it doesn't have power, it doesn't have its own power. It's it's held up by conditions locally, and and yet it, it is subject to those conditions. But that's what holds it up. But a say a model airplane or a model rocket that has its own engine, it it is more directable, perhaps. But it's also heavier. It's it's it can it falls to earth faster, harder, it lands harder, it can crash. Gliders almost never actually crash because they just float down. And and so there's something to be said for saying we're going to relinquish this amount of control and power in our lives and we're going to understand what's holding us, what's really holding us up here, what is really supporting us and and relying on that. And maybe that's part of our test of faith at this time. And, And maybe This is a transient time. In the 70s, I can't tell you how many people looked around and said, oh my gosh, sex, drugs, rock and roll, we are at the end. You know, they were sure. They were absolutely sure that we were clear clear at the end. Sometimes, (laughs) how do we make it through that? Maybe we have a lot more time to make it through this. Maybe not. I don't know. We don't know. We have to rely on faith. That is where we have to come back to. We have to look at the author of our spirits. Who is that? That's God. And as Ali said, that the reality of the of the universe is the reality, whether we believe it or not, you know, and and so that is what we have to start um, believing in. We have to start understanding how to get ourselves into alignment with with what's holding us up and not try to be the ones in charge of it with an with an engine that will weigh us down in the end. Thank you. I'm going to read some comments. Okay. 
Uh, comment one, this actually made things feel a lot less scary. Good job. Yeah. I was a kid in the 70s. My parents were frugal and it never felt scary. I just knew we were responsible for what we did have. Yes, I love that. Um, I want to mention somebody said, you're pretty. She's talking to you. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you for everything that you're sharing. Okay, another comment. I was a 70s kid too, and we didn't have much, but we had the necessities. Our society needs a reality check on needs. Yes. And I, I'll say, I read a thing about how people are complaining about how expensive things are now. And they, they just said in the seventies, like when people say like in the seventies, you could live, you could buy your own house with one income. You could. And it also was probably less than an 800 square foot house. And it probably rotted because it probably didn't have like really good materials that it was made out of. And you probably shared a room with all of your siblings. And, you know, we have a much higher standard of living and it costs more to match. And if we want yeah. to live that way, then we will have to reduce our standard of living and have a smaller space and have less items and have worse items, but it's possible, you know? Yeah. Here's a comment. During the first year of COVID 2020, I made more money than all previous years of being a, of, uh, as being self-employed. This year I made less too. Do you think that stands to reason that I've been forcing making money? I, I lost all my events during 2020, which were big. <clears throat> which were big money makers for me, but I earned more that year than any other year. Does that make any sense what I'm trying to say? Um, I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Maybe not doing as much or forcing events and such is out of alignment for me. That may be. I do feel like when we relax into it, not to say do nothing, like I feel like I can relax into allowing money to flow to me but you all know I work hard. Like every day I'm like, I've got to go tell everybody about everything weird. No one can stop me. And I'm like working hard every day. Um, you know, but I'm not forcing anything. Right. So like, we need to, we need to be doing what we need to do, but I do feel like forcing things and trying to be in control of it. I don't think that's a good recipe for success. Here's a comment. I have had a dream where I was working in a supply tent in a camping situation. Someone comes in needing a pair of size 10 shoes in women's. I ask them if they have a specific color and they say pink. I know there is not a pair in the back, but I check anyway. I pray that they can be manifested and there they are in the color they requested. I am so grateful and they are there and in the color requested. Thank you so much for sharing that. I really believe that is how it's going to be, that we're going to need something and the divine is just going to step up and just give it to us and maybe in a way that we don't expect. And so I love that. Thank you. We need to get ourselves in a space where we can just believe that, that we can wake up and know that we're going to be taken care of. Uh, comment. I know the reality is this economy not doing so good, but the law of attraction shouldn't we not put our focus on it to have more and not attract scarcity. Um, yeah. Well, so the law of attraction is I, I really feel like it's misunderstood. This is my take on the law of attraction. It's not about what you're focused on so much. It's about what you are. And that's why I will speak from my own experience. I had a vision board for years and it didn't come true. Even though I was obsessed with everything on it, it didn't work out for me because why? Because I was still attracting what I was and what I was was not in alignment with what I was thinking about. So when it comes to the law of attraction, um, I feel like the, the, I don't think it's true that, that it's just where our attention is because we all know people that are obsessed with money who are poor. They're obsessed with gaining, with gaining more wealth and they're poor, or we know people that, um, you know, they're just, they're obsessed with different things and they don't get it because that's not how the law of attraction actually works. The law of attraction means that whatever you are vibrating at is what comes to you regardless of where your attention is focused, you attract what you are back to you. So for me, it's, uh, I mean, like, yes, there is, there is a lot to be said for not focusing on the scarcity. We got to focus on the gratitude. Like we talked about in this presentation, we get to be grateful, focus on what we do have, focus on the trust that we're going to be taken care of. Um, at the same time, I think that there is a case for saying um, maybe maybe it is time to say, maybe I don't need a Netflix subscription anymore. Right. Or, um, you know, not to say that we need to be uh, like attracting scarcity, but to be realistic and say, you know, sometimes even people that really have it together have the opportunity to pare down their expenditures to make sure that it's all in alignment, you know? 
Here's a comment. Being okay with much less has been such a game changer for me. If I had lots of extras, I know this would be so stressful right now, but I feel so much peace around the whole situation. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, it's I, I made that video about minimalism and the Pluto return. And it's been really funny how having this mindset shift about stuff and less and more um, has really been a game changer for me as well. Hello, honey. Hold on. I'm almost done. Um, I want to be warm. You want to be warm. Okay. Here's a little hug. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks guys. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to uh, hang out again soon. Um, thank you, my special guest speaker. And um, oh, we have a, one last question. Will you comment on where we should and shouldn't put our savings in IRA? Yes, I will say the divine absolutely has the right answer for you personally. And so go and write, write out a letter to God, skip a line, write the letter back to you, and then go pray about it and see if you feel like that is the right answer for you. Um, you know, all of us are in different situations, but our divine source has every answer that we need in exactly the moment that we need it. So thank you guys so much. We'll see you later. Thanks, expert.